Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. All right. Well, welcome to Sunrise. If you're new with us, this is what we do. This is Sunrise Church. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. I got to show you something I got earlier today. And if you're online, you're going to have to get close. It says, Pastor Warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. It's just like, just like a warning. <laughs> just as read, I swear this as I preach, just so you can have it. Well, welcome to Southern Church. We're glad you're here. And hey, if you would, welcome our Maple Ridge campus. This is going to be going to them. So our Maple Ridge campus is getting this message as well. So give a round of applause for everyone on our Maple Ridge campus. We are starting a new series uh, in the summertime because, hey, it's summer. It's like 30 degrees out. I hope you get to the water or the beach if you like that kind of thing. And if you don't, uh, you'll find something nice to do, I'm sure, in the summertime here. Uh, we are starting a new sermon series. And do you know that all through the Bible, there's thousands of names listed? Thousands. And in fact, some of the most boring parts of the Bible are the names. But when we realize that there's thousands of names and relationships and people and families is because God actually cares for people. That's why people are named there. And in all of those names, relationships, and families, you see that even Jesus himself had people he was connected to. He had three who were called his beloved. He had those who were his friends. Then he had those who were disciples. And larger than that, there was 120 gathered on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had people in his life. And we know this that because God is a God of community, because Jesus is someone who had community around him. We read it with Paul, with people he mentored, and people that encouraged Paul, like Barnabas. We see it in the life of Ruth and Naomi. We see it in David and Jonathan. We see it in David and his mighty men, that we all need people. Say that with me. We all need people. Now, you might be someone who's like, I'm not sure about people on the best of days, but trust me, you wouldn't have got where you are today if you didn't have people in your life. Because people support you, they encourage you, they come around you. And as we come into this sermon series this summer, it's called, Who Are Your People? Say that with me. Who are your people? Because God designs us to be connected with people so that we can be fulfilling our calling and our purpose. Amen? How many have ever had someone really good in their life that has supported them, walked alongside them, encouraged them? All through this sermon series, we're going to tell a bit of story about some of the people in our lives. And today I want to, I want to tell you a bit of story in my life. I have a friend whose name is Jeremy and just chatted with him last night. And, uh, you know, probably 18 years ago we met in the little prairie town of Regina, Saskatchewan. He's the son of a Baptist minister who ended up at a Pentecostal church of all things, you know, surprise, surprise. And God started a relationship. And a relationship that even when we moved from Saskatchewan to BC, it didn't end. In fact, we just had to be more intentional because you needed to keep things up. But Jeremy's been one who's come alongside me, who's been like a champion for me. He's challenged me where I need to be. He's comforted me in prayer. He has been like one of my guys. And every time we go back to Regina, I make a, a, a purpose to, I got to see you. I have to see you. You're one of my people. And, and there's relationships like this that when you get even in close proximity, you just need to connect with them because they're people who cheer you on. They're people who help guide you like a compass. These are the people in your life. We all need people. Say that with me. We all need people. I want to take us right to the very beginning of the Bible today because this is where we take the cues for God in community, the God of community. So if you would, grab your Bible, turn to Genesis 1. That's where we're going to start today. And we're going to read a few verses in Genesis 1. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we have Bibles that you can grab on your way out. Or you can also use the YouVersion Bible app. We love that a lot. We use that constantly, the YouVersion Bible app. 
Now, I'm going to call up a friend of mine because one of the things we love to do in our church is we love to celebrate the nations because we believe God's church is to be a church of all nations. So we love to publicly read scriptures in other languages. So would you welcome my friend, leader in our second service, Eric Mogisha. Would you welcome him as he comes to read the scriptures today? And I need the microphone. It disappeared somewhere. Does anyone? Oh, we'll just take this one, Scott. We're on green here. Okay, we'll just use number one for right now. Thank you. All right, we're going to read Genesis 1, 1 to 3. Yeah. Yes. And tell us what language you're reading in today. I'm going to read in uh, Kinyam. Rengi by the Kinyarwanda Virgin. This is the uh, Good News Bible. It's in Kinyarwanda and uh, English. Munangiro, Imana, and Juruni, see, is he Nashu Yarifite, Candy, Nachar Kiriho, Yari Mezin Kinyanja, Candy, Ichuzum Ejima, Omoka, Imana, Waruhuniki, Amaz, Noko, Imana, Iravuga Iti, Nihabeho, Mucho, Mucho, Uvaho, Amen. Amen. Let's thank Eric for reading. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. And I'll read that in English. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Someone say amen to that. Amen. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And hear this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Lord, we ask you, bless the reading of your word, that as we go through your word today, that there will be pieces that we grab onto because your story is intertwined with what you're calling us to in our story. In Jesus' name we pray. Now here's what I love about this scripture. is right in the very beginning, we see something happening with God that informs our thoughts on community. You see, you read this, that God was there in the very beginning. And then as you keep reading down, you see that the Spirit was there, the Holy Spirit hovering over creation. If you ever thought the Holy Spirit was a new addition in the New Testament, no, 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 he's in eternity past. And then all of a sudden we hear the voice of God creating, which we understand that the voice of God, the very speaking of God is Jesus. He is the Word of God. So what's happening in creation here? Just God doing his own thing? No, no, no. God in relationship as the Trinity is creating. God there sharing the power and the divine nature, the Spirit, the Son, and the Father all together. And what I love about this is this shows me that God is a God of relationship and community right before he created anything. Just think about that for a second. Before God did any activity, God was in relationship and community. And when we think about that, we, we try to digest that, that informs us of the very nature of God. Now, many times we relate to God and his activities, and that's not a bad thing because there's a lot of things God does. But if you relate to God on the relationship of who he is, it's even more powerful. So here's the God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing in relationship, and they're sharing together love and glory. And the first act they do is create. So this God that's in relationship, the very first thing he does is makes something out of nothing. This is the power of our God. Out of relationship, he makes something come out of nothing. Now, when you look at this scripture, you could think, man, okay, God was just hanging out on his like lazy boy, just reclined and just kind of thought, hey, maybe I should do something. It's kind of boring up here just with the three of us. Like, maybe I should do something. That's not, that's not the motivation for God's creation. He wasn't bored. Let me share with you this concept. God in himself, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity sharing love and glory. What was happening before creation? That relationship was there. And it was out of that relationship of Father loving Son and Son, son loving Father and Spirit pouring the love together. It was out of that love that something beautiful was created. And Sherry and I just celebrated 15 years of marriage on Friday. Thank you to the Jansen family so we could have a date night. That was awesome. But out of the love 
that we had, a family unit was created. Out of the love that we shared, all of a sudden, we, two just didn't become one. Two became three. All of a sudden, there was three of us together. It was Sherry and me and Ezekiel, and a family bond was created. So every time we talk about anniversary, we always include Ezekiel. We say, happy birth, happy anniversary to you, Ezekiel, because this is the anniversary of you coming into this family. And something happens out of relationship. God births something in creation. What was happening before creation, if you would with me, turn over to John 17. This is in the New Testament of the Bible. This is Jesus when he's praying. He's praying initially for his followers, his disciples. He's, he's praying to God the Father. And as you read through this whole chapter, if you take the time, you'll find that Jesus constantly refers to God as the Father here. And he says something that is so powerful and serves as the basis for what's happening before creation. John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also, this is us, the, the people who come to faith through the disciples, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am and see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Let me read that one more time. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I really want to pause there. What's happening before creation is even a thing? Maple Ridge, what's happening before creation is even a thing? The Father is loving the Son. Whoa, just let that sink in. God's not making a plan and a strategy for creation at that time. God's not making a plan and strategy to send Jesus to the earth. He is showing his love to his son. Just camp on that for a second. The God you serve is a God that for all eternity has been loving his child. Just think about that for your relationship with God. Sometimes we feel different levels of judgment from God in our lives. And I don't mean if you did something wrong and obviously you just feel like God is a God who's a judge. Other times we feel God is a God who is distant from us. He's far away. Other times we feel like God because of his distance and his judgment is a God who only is interested in punishing us. In fact, I was, I was randomly watched this like sermon this week and and it really just, it really disturbed my spirit because the pastor was just lividly mad, just ripping on the congregation for not reading the word of God enough. Like, I mean mad. And he's like screaming. He's like, ah, you lazy people. I'm just like, I'm thinking, I think we're talking about a different God here because my God, it says his kindness brings me to repent. So some of you, you dip, you've, you've had a different box of God in your life. You've not had a box where God has been gracious and loving. And I really think today, we need to think about this. God, before creation, what is he doing? Totally, completely satisfied himself. He's loving the son. He's loving the child. If you ever wondered if you're loved by God, 1,000% yes. A thousand times yes, you're loved by God. Why? Because what Jesus gets from the Father, he pours unto us. And it says in Romans 5, 5, that it's this Holy Spirit's job to pour the love of God into our hearts. So what's happening in that, that trinity before creation? Foundation, before the foundations. God is loving the Son and the Holy Spirit is doing his work, stirring up that love, preparing one day to pour that love into humans. Whoa. What's God doing? Existing in perfect trinity, the Father loving the Son. Let me just jump off on one other thing, which I didn't plan, but I think I need to say. This God, who many times we relate to, we say, God, you're my provider. We can say amen to that, right? God, you're my provider. Amen. God, you're my healer. Amen. God, you're my guide. Amen. Many times we relate to God on his activities. Not wrong, but not deep enough. Because there's, has there been times where you felt God didn't provide? Let's be honest, right? There's times you probably felt, God, you didn't provide. But he was doing something different. There's times where you feel like, God, you didn't guide me. But he was actually doing something different. 
So let me just back this up, okay? If you relate to God on his activities only, when his activities aren't as you expect, it breaks trust with you and God. It starts to put a barrier up sometimes. But if you relate to God as a loving father, you know this. He provides the right thing at the right time. If God is a God who guides, he guides you as a good father to the right thing at the right time. But if you relate to him, God, you're my guide. You said you'd be my guide, but you're not guiding me now. And you're like, God, just like you're mad at him and you built distrust and you build up a barrier. But God's back here saying, I'm a loving father. I will guide you to the right place at the right time. Sometimes we feel like, God, you didn't protect me. You didn't step in. Can I tell you this? A good father knows when children need to be challenged to step out so it grows them. It is not right for me to protect my children from everything. Okay? Yeah, you might disagree. But God doesn't protect me from everything. He actually puts me into situations where I have to depend on him. Where I have to use the wisdom he's given me and the power of the spirit to make decisions. And for me as a father, I, I, I don't want to protect them from everything. I want them to experience all God has ordained for them so that they will be the men and women he's called them to be. Are you with me? So we take our cues from community, from God. And we're going to talk about five different relationships all summer long that we need to look at in our lives and we need to have in our lives and we need to be towards people. The eternal God, the creator revealed as father, is loving the son. If you get anything from this today, do not move on from the fact that before eternity, before creation, in eternity, God was loving his son. We see God in the Trinity dwelling in this perfect community. What's happening? Love and glory being shared. In fact, earlier in the passage that we just read in John 17, Jesus says, the love, the glory that you had with me before the foundation of the earth. In eternity, God is sending his love through his son and by his spirit. You see, I think this, the reason God created was not because he just needed a plan. The reason God created is that love is too good not to share. That out of that loving relationship, he had to create. Because it's too good not to share. He wanted people to experience this. Let me keep going. I want to talk to you about another one of my people in my life. His name is Andrew. And we scrolled back in our text messages this year. Get this. My friend Andrew, who's a pastor in Regina, has been praying for you, Sunrise Church. I think it's been over 10 years now, but we went back to 2017. He's been praying every Sunday morning for this church and for myself and my family and Sherry. Amen. That's what he's been doing. These are the kind of people we need in our life. I call him my Barnabas because he's there just, he's just there to encourage me, to support me, to cheer me on, to send me scripture. He, he's even on a holiday this Sunday morning, and he still sent me like five text pages of scripture, not just like, the Lord bless you and keep you, da, 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 praying for you. No, no, no. It's like scripture, 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 prayer, scripture, scripture, scripture. And I send it back, thanks. You know, it's just like, I'm not as good. Like, so we, he said it took him 10 minutes of scrolling on his screen, even to get back to like 2020. And I was doing an iMessage. I'm like scrolling, 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 scrolling. I got to 2018. It was incredible. You need people in life. He is, he is one who cheers for me. He is one who comforts me when I need. He's like my Barnabas. So I got people like Jeremy. I got people like Andrew. We need them in all sorts, near and far. And in our life, we need people in our life. I'm, I'm going to show you. We got just a picture up here. There, there's five relationships we're going to be talking about all summer. You need the person over here who will cheer for you, who literally, they're behind you, who when the day is going rough, you text them and you say, can you just pray for me? You need the person who cheers for you. And it's great because we're in this, we're in this moment, like the Olympics are coming. Everyone, you become a fan of the Olympics. Right now, Copa America, everyone becomes a fan of Canada. First time in the tournament, they're in the semifinals. Boo Argentina, go Canada. Come on, let's do this. You know, and then this week, it's the Lions versus the Riders. Home game at the field. I'm going, I'm going to be dressed in green. People are going to be 
cheering. You need people who cheer for you in your life. Number two, you need people who challenge you. And I don't mean they're just there to tear you down. I mean, they challenge you. They make you better. They help hone the edges off you and say, hey, here's something that you might not see, but they challenge you to be better. The third relationship you need, we need someone who champions you. What's a, a cheer person just cheers for you. But a champion comes alongside you to make sure you will win in life. So they are just, they're just, they are for you 100%. They champion you. They're like, go for it. They push you forward. And when I think about like the Olympics coming and I think about Canada playing in the Copa, they need people around them, right? The third thing, you need a person like a compass. Here's Mark Gordon, who's loved our church and came down to preach. Pastor Mark Gordon, we love him from Kelowna. You need people who are like a compass in your life. And the person who's a compass, they help correct you when you're going off. And if they do it in the spirit of Jesus, they do it in love. They don't do it by yelling at you. They do it in the spirit of love. They help say, hey, you know what? This isn't quite right in your life. And to have a compass in your life, you need to be humble. Because you won't receive direction if you're not humble. So we need, we need a compass. And then you need people over here on the far side, people who comfort you. This, this is literally at our conference like, like six weeks ago. And Brother Capan is getting prayed for. And he's praying for uh, Brother Dave from High River Church. This is like people are, God's delivering comfort. You need people who can come alongside you. And when you're walking in grief and brokenness, they need, can come and they can lift you up. They can come and give you the hug, give you whatever you need. These are the five relationships we're going to be talking about all summer. And we need to reflect, God, who is my person who cheers for me? And who am I cheering for? Who is the person who challenges me? And who am I challenging? Who is the person who is my champion? Who is the person, my comforter and my compass? Church, this is something that we really believe we need. And as we go through all the word of God, we're going to see these relationships in the biblical narratives. Let's go back to the book of Genesis again. And turn with me to Genesis 1, and we're going to read 26 and 27 of the first chapter. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over all of the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Here's a couple of beautiful things we see. God speaking in the plurality of the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. Let us make them in our image to have dominion like God had dominion. But here's what's so beautiful. He creates us male and female in his image. And we just talked about God, who's a God of community and relationship. Part of who he is in his identity is community and relationship. So when he creates you and me in his image, he creates us for relationship and community. If you wondered why you have a need for deep, good friendships and people to challenge you, if you wonder why you have a need and desire to have people who will champion you and care for you and comfort you, it's because God created you in his image with that very thing. And if God creates us in his image, he creates it and he sows, us, sows that into us because that's his very trait. You know, in the story of creation, you read it in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, everything is, is really good. In fact, God says, this is good, this is good, this is good. And when he gets to creating man, he says, this is very good, the achievement, the top achievement of his creation. But before sin enters the world in Genesis 3, there's one thing we read that is not good. Do you know what the one thing is that's not good? It's when man is alone. That's the one thing in creation, hear this, before sin entered the world to corrupt and stain the world that was not good, that's people being alone. So Adam, the human, representing the mankind, gets Eve, the first, they come together in one flesh and they join in union. Why? Because God knows it's not good for people to be alone. The one thing in creation that was not good even before sin was the fact that people were alone. The issue in creation was not dominion. It wasn't naming animals. God didn't have a problem creating. He didn't have a problem bringing water together. He didn't have a problem seasons, sun, moons. He didn't have a problem. The only struggle and the issue in creation was in relationship. Since God is in community and we're created in his image, we are created 
for community. God has created us to be shaped by relationships of appreciation, of love, and connection. And the people you need in your life, I don't want to tell you that you just need people so you got these people around you so that your friend list is big, so your TikTok followers are awesome. You need people around you that enable you to live into your calling and purpose. That's it. Those five relationships, those are people who will help you live in, lean into your calling and your purpose. That's what they're there for. That's what they come around you for. I want to tell a third story about some of the people in my life. Uh, all, all through my pastoral career, I've had different mentor groups and, and, and really tight ministry friend groups. And, and when I was becoming a lead pastor, I was praying and said, Lord, I, I need a different level of friends because I'm stepping into a lead role and it's a whole different conversation you have as a leader. And um, it's different from when you're an associate or an assistant pastor. It's just you, you handle different things. And so I got a text from a friend of mine who leads, a, at that time, led a national uh, leadership ministry and said, hey, I'm putting together this group of six lead pastors from around Canada. Would you like to be a part of this group? And I'm like, I literally saw the text and I, I started just weeping and said, like, yes, Lord, this is exactly what I need. And so we started with a group of six. It's a group of five now. And we've been together for now, I think, eight and a half years all across Canada. And what the crazy thing is, one of the guys I've never even met in person yet. But the others I've met in person just because we've been close, we fly into each other's cities. But God has given me a group of men around me that are in the same uh, field uh, of ministry and the same level of challenge, the same style of churches, all different things. And, and they're, they're cheering me on. They're championing me. I need those people in my life. I would not be the pastor I am without those people in my life. In fact, it wasn't until um, one of the guys, he's a pastor in Brandon, uh, I hadn't met him. It had been like seven years we'd been on this group online together every month, every month, every month, a couple hours every month. We hadn't met until he was in Regina and I was in Regina teaching. And he came from Brandon to Regina for like an event and I came to teach. And like we met for like an hour and a half and that was like, that was it. That was the first connection we had had. But God had made that relationship. He brought those people around me. God is a God in community because we're created in his image. He creates us for community. We all need people. I'm going to bring this to the points about Jesus. Jesus, as I said earlier, he had people in his life. But a lot of times we just think of Jesus with his disciples, his apostles, and the people he taught. But you know, there's three people in his life that you really never read have the quality or the qualifier of disciple. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They're never noted as disciples. They're not noted as followers. They're noted first in the book of Luke where they open their home up to him. Then you read it in, in John, where Lazarus dies, Jesus is moved emotionally, weeps. And there's this whole thing where he resurrects him. What's beautiful about this is you see that Jesus actually modeled in the Gospels friendship. Why, why are Lazarus, Mary, and Martha there? Because they were his friends. They were with him. They invited him into the home. Everyone had a need with Jesus. <laughs> Healing, hope, something. These people were just with him. They just, they, they listen to him. They serve him. They're just literally his friends. They're not noted as followers, disciples, apostles. Jesus weeps when he hears of the death. Second to that, Jesus had a group who are commonly referred to as the beloved Peter, James, and John. And if you want my opinion, I think John gave himself his own name, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think John, I think John was John's signatures on that. He had his three, his three close. Then he had the 12. He walked with the 12, the disciples that became the apostles. Then he sent 70 people out. And there were thousands of crowds, thousands and thousands around him. But at the day of Pentecost, there was only 120 people. God is in community. He created us in his image, which means we need community. We need people around us. Jesus himself walked with friends close disciples, 12 disciples, and then more. We need these relationships in life. Church, we all need people that enable us to live into and lean into our calling and our purpose. Are you with me this morning? Yes, sir. Thanks, Ike. God's in community. Jesus is in community. Number three, the church as a community. Church, 
we are most commonly referred to in the New Testament as the body of Christ. That we are one. Just look around you right now. Look around you. Look at someone, make eye contact with someone you might not know, and say, we are one. It might be a little creepy, but just say it. We are one. If you're an introvert, you're like freaking out right now. What else is Pastor Chris going to ask? Is he going to call my name? No. We are one. We're a body. Now, in the same way that we're one, we're imperfect. But let me just encourage you and challenge you with this. Don't expect the body of Christ to be something to you that you aren't to one of them. So meaning, don't expect the body of Christ to serve you and love you and support you if you have not entered into relationships of service, love, and support. Okay? A lot of times people are like, oh man, the church is so bad. It's just, they're hurting people. No, no, no. You probably got hurt by one person or two people or a family. That's the truth. Let's, it's not the whole church. It's not Jesus. He didn't do it to you. But you're like, yeah, the church didn't. And then the question you could ask is, how did you serve? How did you support? How did you love? Now, we all go through seasons where we'll need more service and, and support. We'll need that. And that's, that's what the body of Christ is here for. But we are supposed to be a community because God has created us in his image, and he's in community, and Jesus needed it. We needed it. All through the New Testament, I think it's maybe 48 or 53 times, we read the one another instructions. Love one another. Honor one another. It actually says, outdo one another with showing honor. I love that. The one time in the New Testament, we're told to compete do you get that? The one time that you're told to like strive to be better than someone, the only time where you are told to try to make it a competition is to honor other people. That's because we're supposed to be a community. Honoring people. That's what we love to honor people. Like we do the Hope and Purpose Award early in the year. And then we do the Mother in the House Award. We do the Father in the House Award. Every month we do a terrific Tuesday Award that we give to someone as a staff. We just want to be people who honor. Because the scripture tells me, outdo one another in showing honor. The gathered groups of the church are supposed to be community. That's why he called us out to call us in. Many early church letters carry with them relational advice direction. In fact, one of my favorite things Paul says to the church of Philippi, he, this is super easy. He just says this. He's like, I urge you, you Odia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Boom. They're having a problem. They're having a fight. He doesn't call them out any more than that. Now remember, those letters were read publicly in a group of people. So that was like, if you had a problem with someone, you would hear it publicly from the reader. That's how it would happen in the early church. So it was like, if you were in the pew, and you heard that you just got called out. And he's like, agree in the Lord. Why? Because for Paul, he understood community was the nature of the church. But we are imperfect people. Please, church, do not expect the body of Christ to be something for you that you are not for it. Okay? Don't do that. Because that, 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 that puts you in a place of righteousness. You start judging the body, but you're not actually being the body. Church is not a place. Oh, I might, I might start preaching. Church is not a place we just attend. Church is a place where we are active and our gifts are supposed to be activated. Are you with me? Come on, church. Church is not a place where you just show up and you sit in your seat. This is about the mission of God and investing in the community and pouring into people and seeing disciples made and seeing people baptized. Yeah, just don't show up in church. Mmm. Come on, preach. Come, come on. Church, you don't consume the church. You don't look for the worship style that fits you or the group that is tailored to you or the preacher you like because he's got a little bit of Andy Stanley. He's got some Stephen Furtick, but he's also got some Dr. Charles Stanley and a little bit of Rick Warren and a hug. You don't come to consume the church because it's got the youth program you like or Auntie Pam who you like. You come to contribute to the church because you are the church and you're not a cannibal. You do not consume it because you're not a cannibal. It's you. You don't eat the church. You don't consume the church. Sometimes we do the same thing to church that we do after church when we're like, where are we going to go for lunch? Come on now. 
You do the same thing to church that you do when you go, I want, this is what I want. I want someone to come to my table. I want them to serve me. I want them to know my order before I even decide. Come on, church, we're not here to consume. We're here to contribute. It is one of our key values. That's why I get fired up about it. We're here to contribute. And there's nothing wrong in church, I'll say this, with making your needs known to people. No, nothing wrong. Because the church is supposed to meet needs. But don't expect the church to meet all your needs if you're not going to be there to help others. Yes, we have needs. But church, let me tell you this. The needs you have are designed by God to be met in community. That's it. You wander around, you're like, ah, I got some problems, I got some going on. But you're not in a relationship with anybody. It's hard to meet your need. Not all of us have a prophetic gift to read what's going on in your life and understand. Let me say this. Sometimes we say, God, there's, there's something more I want in my life. There's something I need that's greater. Let me tell you this. The more that God has for you is designed to flow through his body. Are you with me? The more that you need is designed to flow through his body. That's why I need people who will cheer for us. People who will comfort us. People who will challenge us. People who will be our compass. People who will be our champion. You just don't attend. You're active and you're activated. You just don't show up. You invest. You do not consume the church as a cannibal. You contribute to the church because the church is a body. Let me ask you this question. And I do not ask it in a, in a hard spirit. If you were to leave Sunrise Church and be like, I'm done. I'm not coming back. Would we know? Yes, if you're in community. Yes, if you're connected. But if not, no. We, we, we can't possibly love everyone the way we would love, want to. But we try to practice the principle of like, we do for one person what we wish we could do for everyone. We do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. But if you're connected with community, guess what? We know when you're gone. We know when you go. Dolores and Andre, it's your last Sunday with us. I'm, I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> You're getting sent out. Two-year leave. We'll give you a two-year leave to North Carolina. You can be like two years planted at Elevation Church in the Matthews campus. You know, you can do that. You can do that. But we know that they're going to leave because they've been part of the community. Church, this, is be this beckons us to live in community and to live in these types of relationships. And I, I tell you this, our staff team and our pastoral team cannot meet all your needs. We never can. Because we, we're trying to meet needs of lots of people. We're trying to be in community. Sherry and I have hosted for years a community group at our house. We have people in our community. And when they're not there, we miss them. We need to be in community. If you left, would we know? Pro y yes, if you're connected, if you're in community, we, we would miss you. We need to be in community. This, this is a call for some of you. You've been a bit on the fringe. Take a step in. We, we talked about engage class coming up in a couple weeks. Take a step in in, get connected. And you might be fearful. Maybe there's church hurt in the background. We are not a perfect church, but we will do our best to love you. And Lord, right now, if there's anyone in this congregation or even Maple Ridge campus, as they hear this at that location, Lord, that has church hurt, we just pray healing over that, that you'd be gracious, that you'd heal that in Jesus' name. Church, as we come to land this, there's, there's three things. And we're going to be telling you this all summer, these three things. Number one, we need to prioritize our relationship with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had a relationship with the Father in which he experienced love. And if you prioritize your relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit does what he's promised to do. He pours the love of God into your hearts. Romans 5, 5. Prioritize your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you hear and experience him best through worship. Just like download every worship album. Talk to Margie. Just get some good worship going. Talk to our worship leaders. Maybe you hear him best through the word of God. Get on the reading plans. Maybe you hear him best in nature. Go for a good walk. Go for a good hike. Get down to the White Rock Beach. Get to Crescent Beach. Put your toes in the water that he created. Imagine the Red Sea being split as your toes hit the water. Just be with him. Prioritize your relationship with him. Number two, and you're going to hear these lots this summer, cultivate relationships with others that enable you to live out your calling and purpose. You know what this really means, church? 
There will be people in your life that rather than being a champion or a comforter or a compass, they're literally there and all they want to do is be in conflict with you. I'm not talking about your, your, your marriage or your family. I'm talking, about, I'm, pe- I'm talking about people around you. Those voices need to be minimized and the voices of those who champion you and cheer for you need to be maximized. So cultivate the relationships. And I would encourage you, because we're going to be talking about this all summer, think of those five relationships. And, and at one point, we're going to have a card for you, and you can sketch some names on there, who you think is in those relationships, who cheers for you, who comforts you, who's your compass. We need to cultivate the relationships. Worship team, would you come? And lastly, we need to be the person who cheers for others, comforts others, champions others, challenges others, and is a compass to guide. God calls us to be those people in the body of Christ for the body of Christ. Let me end with one story. I've had the privilege in my life to marry a number of couples. And some of my favorite people to marry are people who do not yet know the Lord. The reason why is I tell them I'm a Christian minister. I'm going to do a Christian wedding. And literally, they come into my office to meet to talk about Jesus. Evangelism made easy. It's so good. (laughs) But every time I've married a couple who's not been a Christian, I take time to pray for them and bless them. And this is what they say to me. There's no one in my life who blesses me. There's no one in my life who prays for me. These are two things I don't even understand. Church, you have a role outside of the body of Christ to be a blessing and to pray for people. You know, I'll just tell you this. I have never had anyone say no to prayer or a blessing when I've offered. I've not. I'm, not, I'm sure I will run into it, but it's how you, it's how you say it. I'm going to pray for you in thy name, thy kingdom. I just say this. Could I bless you? Could I bless you? You guys can start playing. In fact, before we left Regina 10 years ago, it's like our 10-year anniversary of being in BC. 10 years ago would have been my first Sunday here. Um, One of the couples that I had married came to our house the day before we left and said, No one blesses us, no one prays for us, and you're leaving. Would you bless us and pray for us before you leave? I don't know. Yeah, this is easy. And they even, because they just, they're such wonderful people, honoring people, they they brought us gifts. Here's some gifts for you to take. We just, we love, thank you for pastoring us. And this was like a year and a half after their anniversary. This wasn't like I just married them. It was like a year and a half before. Church, not only do we have a role in the body, but we have a role outside to be people of blessing to be people who champion others. Think about that. There's not people in the world who don't know Jesus. They don't know what a blessing is. They don't know what it's like to be prayed for. Church, there's many people around us and even here today who are far from God. And it's my prayer today that as you've heard the word, you've been in worship, you've witnessed baptisms and the table, that you've taken a step closer to Jesus. you would be formed in his likeness more and more. Why don't we stand and I'm going to pray and then we're going to worship. Lord Jesus, as we're here today, thank you that before the foundations of the world, you dwelt in community. That you're a God of community. That you're a God who loves your children because you exemplified that in loving Jesus. And you sent the Spirit to pour the love of Jesus and the love of God into our hearts. Lord, today we want to be people who have others around us who champion us, cheer for us, challenge us. We want to be people who do that for others. We want to lean into that so that we can fulfill our calling and purpose and so that others can fulfill their calling and their purpose. And Lord, outside those who call you Lord, God, give us keys into those relationships so that we might live as a blessing, that we might live as a prayer person for that person who doesn't even know how to call on the name of Jesus. Lord, refresh us today that we might be on mission for you. And as we're released from this place, God, we would go into the field and we would be a blessing to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.